This video has been designed and produced to provide you with the information you require to perform the quality service Kirby owners expect and deserve. Please follow the detailed instructions accurately when servicing the Kirby G4. The instructions contain important specifications such as tightening torques that are critical to the performance of the G4. The component parts, materials, and supplies in the Kirby G4, as well as all Kirby models, have been designed, tested, and approved by Kirby engineers and quality assurance technicians to provide optimum performance. To maintain optimum performance of all Kirby models, use only genuine Kirby parts and supplies when performing repairs and providing service. Genuine Kirby parts and supplies are available through your local distribution center. With the exception of the bag top assembly, this troubleshooting video is applicable to the Generation 3 and G4. Service manuals are also available as a guide to assist with servicing the Generation 3 and G4. If the problem is the motor does not run, check your power supply and verify that you have power to the outlet. Uh, check your power cord. If the cord's defective or you think it's defective, replace the power cord and try another power cord. Uh, verify that your mini emptor and your nozzle are connected to the unit. And you also want to check your nozzle and make sure that the attachment lug is on and is active activating the power switch. Uh, this lug right here must be in place to activate the power switch. Lock the mini emptor in place to activate the power switch. The next item to check where a motor does not run would be the power switch. To remove the power switch you need to disassemble the machine. Uh, to remove the cord, remove the screw at the cord clip on the scuff plate. Remove the screw at the side of the machine that holds on the cord cover. To remove the cord cover, you will need to push the cover forward towards the nozzle and pull it out at the top. And remove the cord clip from the scuff plate. To remove the scuff plate, remove the screw above your neutral drive pedal. To remove the scuff plate, it will be necessary to insert a flat bladed screwdriver in this opening and pry up. To release the tabs at the front of the scuff plate, push backward with both thumbs ahead of the handle pivot spring assembly and lift off. You need to take care that you do not break the two clips located at the front of the scuff plate. To remove the cover shell, it will be necessary to remove the Phillips head screws on either side of the foot pedal. It will also be necessary to remove the two Phillips head screws from the front of the cover shell. To remove the cover shell from the unit, lift up and pull back. To replace the power switch, it will be necessary to remove the foot pedal from the transmission. Carefully pry up on the foot pedal at the transmission. It may be necessary to pry the foot switch actuator rod towards the transmission to allow the rod to raise up. Uh, once the rod is up, then you can slide the foot pedal off of the actuator rod. To remove the transmission, it will be necessary to depress the neutral drive pedal on the drive side. Remove the three transmission mounting screws. They are located here and here. Leave this screw in place. To remove the transmission, it will be necessary to raise your power switch actuator rod up. Then as you drop the transmission down, through the opening in the base assembly, carefully remove the drive belt. To remove the slide bracket casting, it will be necessary to first disconnect your jumper wire. To do so, cut the wire tie located over the clear plastic insulator. Slide the insulator back, disconnect the connection. Next, it will be necessary to remove the two screws located at the back of the slide bracket casting. The next two screws to remove will be the screws located at the top of the fan case. To remove the slide bracket casting, lift up and remove your upper headlight lead wire. 
But to remove the actuator rod, it will be necessary to rotate it up at a 90 degree angle and push down to release. To remove the right brush holder, it will be necessary to remove this screw. Carefully rotate the brush holder downward away from the screw and pull the wire off of the power switch. Next, disconnect the left brush lead wire and remove the headlight jumper lead wire. Remove the power switch mounting screw. To remove the power switch, it will be necessary to pry the power switch back at the bearing plate. When reinstalling the power switch, verify that you have eight terminals on your field coil and make sure they are straight. They have to lock into the power switch when the power switch is installed to the motor housing. When reinstalling the power switch, use this edge of the motor housing as a guide for the edge of the power switch. The speed actuators need to pass through the opening in the fan case and base pan at this location when installing the power switch. Use the motor housing as a guide Rest the power switch up against the motor housing and press down against the motor housing and push forward to lock the terminals into the power switch. Next, install the power switch mounting screw. It is very important that you use a torque screwdriver for this step and set the screwdriver to four to six inch pounds of torque. Next, install your left brush lead wire. This will go into the top terminal located at the back of the power switch. Next, install your right brush lead wire onto the lower terminal of the power switch. If these brush lead wires are connected to the wrong terminals, the motor will be running in the opposite direction. It is very important to have the left brush lead wire plugged into the top terminal and your right brush lead wire into the bottom terminal. When installing the brush holder, it is very important that you have this tab located on the brush holder aligned with this slot located in the motor housing. Push the carbon brush in the holder and rest it against the armature. Engage the tab at the bottom of the brush holder in the slot in the motor housing and rotate the brush in towards the top to engage it into the motor housing. Install the power switch mounting screw. Again, it's very important that this screw be tightened with a torque screwdriver. The torque setting for this screw is four to six inch pounds. To install the power switch actuator rod, hold the rod up at a 90 degree angle at the opening located at the bottom of the power switch actuator and lift up to engage. Plug the cord into the power switch, install the bag mini emptor assembly to the exhaust port, and install the nozzle to the fan case. To start the motor, lift up on the actuator rod and keep your hands clear of any moving parts to the motor. Push in the actuator rod to start the motor. If the motor now operates, refer to section 30 of the video for complete reassembly instructions. Also verify that your brush is not sticking in the holder. It should slide in smoothly and release smoothly. If the brush is stuck in the cartridge, it will be necessary to replace the complete brush holder cartridge assembly. The brush is not replaceable as a unit by itself. Also, either brush lead wire could be defective and cause a motor not to run. Uh, inspect the brush lead wire and replace if you feel it's necessary. If the motor still does not operate, it will be necessary to replace the complete motor assembly or the field and armature. To remove the motor assembly, it will be necessary to remove the exhaust duct screw. To remove the exhaust duct, pry out at the opening located at the top and lift up on the bottom of the exhaust duct with your finger. If you are servicing an earlier model generation 3 that contains a filter in the exhaust duct, it is recommended that you remove and discard the filter and do not replace it. To remove the motor assembly from the base casting, it will be necessary to remove the rear motor mount screws. 
Next, remove the front motor mount screws. They are located in wells behind the fan case. To remove the motor assembly from the base casting, lift up and pull back. For further disassembly of the motor, it will be necessary to remove the brush holder assemblies, the brush lead wires, and the power switch. When removing the fan, it will be necessary to insert an 11 open end wrench on the flat spots of the armature shaft located just ahead of the rear bearing. Insert the wrench onto the flat section of the armature shaft ahead of the rear bearing. Insert the fan locking pin into the hole on the motor pulley. Rotate the pulley clockwise. The pulley has left hand threads and remove the pulley. Next, remove the metal fan washer, the fan blade, the mylar washer. Earlier model generation 3's will not contain a mylar washer. When replacing the fan, it is necessary to use a mylar washer. Remove the spacer seal assembly. To remove the motor sprocket gear, it will be necessary to remove the snap ring located at the back of the armature shaft. Use a pair of snap ring pliers to do so. And only spread the clip as far as necessary to remove it. Carefully pry the motor sprocket rearward using a flat blade screwdriver. To remove the bearing plate, remove the four bearing plate screws. S slide the bearing plate off of the armature shaft. To remove the armature, carefully pull it out of the motor housing. In the well of the motor housing is located a finger spring and the static washer. Be careful not to lose these. A normal armature should appear like this. An armature with raised or burned commutator bars or damaged wiring would be a probable cause for an armature to fail. Replace the armature if you encounter any of these conditions. To remove the field coil from the motor housing, remove these two screws. Slide the field coil out by pressing on it with your thumbs in this location. Inspect the field for any damaged wires or burned wires and also verify that you do have eight terminals in place. If there is a broken terminal, it will be necessary to replace the field coil. Also, with any damaged or burned wires, it will be necessary to replace the field coil. On Canadian motors only, the left brush lead wire contains a fuse. A blown fuse will cause a motor not to run. To replace this fuse, pull apart the yellow holder Remove the fuse from the holder and insert a new fuse. Plug the connection back together and test the motor. Two types of EMI filters are used in some international markets. There is the four wire and there is the five wire. The five wire uses a static discharge wire which attaches to the left rear motor mount screw. The five wire also has a longer circuit board and cover. If you do not have a four wire circuit board available, you can adapt it to a five wire by changing the circuit board, the cover, and adding the static discharge wire. Do not change from a five wire to a four wire EMI filter assembly. A defective EMI circuit board could cause either motor to fail to run. To examine or replace the circuit board, remove the two screws located at either side of the cover. To replace a four-wire EMI filter, remove the cover and unplug the four wires from the EMI circuit board. Remove the board and 
install a new board. The screw on the bottom of the board should rest in the hole in the motor housing. The wire attachments are color coded. There is an O to denote where the orange wire goes, a G for the green wire, there is an R for the red, and a Y for the yellow. Install the wires to the circuit board. This is the position of the red wire. This is the position of the yellow wire. This is the position of the orange wire. And this is the position of the green wire. When installing the cover, it is important that you do not pinch the wires. Torque the EMI circuit board cover screws down to four to six inch pounds. The five wire EMI wires up the same as a four wire EMI with the exception of the static discharge wire. The static discharge wire plugs into the back of the EMI board and the eyelet of the static discharge wire attaches to the left rear motor mount screw. The two resistors located on the lower right corner of the circuit board are intended to help eliminate static electricity from the outside services of the cleaner. It is important to the safety of the machine that these two resistors are not replaced or altered. If there is any indication that the resistors have been damaged or overheated, the board should be replaced and the unit should be retested. Australian motors may use a five-wire EMI circuit board assembly, but with no coils or capacitors. It will contain the two resistors for static resistance. If the problem is the motor only runs on one speed, Check your nozzle and make sure that the lug is intact. This operates the power switch and will engage it on low speed. Another problem that could cause a motor only to run on one speed would be if the lug was broken off of the suction blower end of the hose. A defective power switch could also cause a motor to only run on one speed. Inspect the speed actuators and verify they're both in place. Also, the power switch could have an internal problem. In both cases, the entire power switch should be replaced. A defective field coil could also cause a motor to only run on one speed. Repair of this field coil is described in section one of the video. If the problem is the motor continues to run with the nozzle or mini empty removed, the power switch is defective. Replace the power switch as described in section one of the video. If the problem is the motor runs briefly and stops, or the motor runs intermittently, the power cord could be defective or loose at the switch. Check the power cord for brakes, replace if necessary. Check the power cord where it plugs into the switch. The power cord should fit snugly. If it does not, the power switch is probably cracked at the bucket. The power switch could be cracked right in this area here at the bucket. This would cause a cord to fit loose into the power switch. Another defect with the power switch that would cause the motor to run briefly or intermittently would be an internal defect to the power switch. In either case, the power switch should be replaced as described in section one of the video. Also inspect the brush to be sure it slides in and out of the holder assembly properly. It should not stick or drag. If it does, the whole brush holder assembly must be replaced. If during your repairs you notice an excessive amount of arcing coming from the armature at the brushes, or if you notice an electrical smell, check to be sure the motor does not bind. It could have a broken or blocked fan blade. 
Rotate the fan pulley with your hand to ensure that it is not bound. If the fan is blocked, see section 10 of the video for fan and fan case disassembly. Another cause of armature and carbon brushes sparking would be if your brush was stuck in the holder. Check the brush and make sure it slides in and out of the holder. Replacement is described in section one of the video. A defective armature could also cause sparking at the brushes and the armature. Inspect the armature, commutator bars for raised bars or any scoring. Replacement of the armature is described in section one of the video. If the motor continues to spark from the armature and brushes, after replacing the brushes and the armature, the field coil is defective. Replace the field coil is described in section one of the video. In rare cases, the power switch could also cause excessive arcing at the armature and brushes. Replacement of the power switch is described in step one of the video. If the problem is the motor vibrates, inspect the fan blade be sure it's not chipped or worn or has any missing blades. If it is, it's going to require re replacement. Fan replacement is covered in step one. Fan case removal is covered in step 10. The fan pulley itself could cause a motor vibration problem if the fan pulley is out of round. If the pulley wobbles while spinning the motor over, replace the fan pulley itself. Replacement of the fan pulley is described in section one of the video. A defective motor bearing could cause a motor to vibrate also. To replace the front bearing, remove the bearing plate as described in section one of the video. Flip the bearing plate over. On the back side of the bearing plate is contained a snap ring. Remove the snap ring with a pair of snap ring pliers. Flip the bearing plate back over. Gently tap the bearing out with a motor pulley and a hammer. <coughs> to replace the front bearing, insert the bearing into the bearing plate. Reinstall the snap ring. And make sure the snap ring is all the way seated in the bearing plate well. If the rear bearing requires replacement, remove the armature as described in section one of the video. Install the bearing puller between the armature commutator bars and the rear bearing and tighten the bolt. As you tighten the bolt on the bearing puller, it will pull the bearing off the shaft of the armature. When reinstalling the bearing, take care and only apply pressure to the inner race of the bearing. Do not apply pressure to the outside of the bearing. As you are tapping on the bearing, it will damage the bearing. If the problem is the motor runs hot on an earlier model, generation three, it could be due to a e blocked exhaust vent screen. Remove and discard the filter if it is in place. A defective field or armature could also cause a motor to run hot. Inspect the armature commutator bars. Look for any scoring or raised bars. Also inspect the wiring for any damage. On a field coil, also inspect the wiring for any damage and look for any uh, signs of burning or arcing. Replacement of both items is described in section one of the video. If you are experiencing motor bearing noise, one or both of the bearings may need to be replaced. One indication for a bad bearing would be roughness felt. Spin the inner race of the front bearing with your finger to feel for roughness or sticking. 
replacement of the front bearing is described in section 6. Also, you can inspect the rear bearing for roughness by spinning the bearing on the shaft. Replacement of the rear bearing is described in section 6. If the motor makes a squealing noise on wind down, the most likely cause would be a squeal coming from the seal behind the fan. Remove the fan as described in section 1 using an 11 30 seconds opened end wrench and a fan locking pin. Wipe any debris away from the bearing plate eyelet surface with a clean rag. Then apply a thin visible layer of T159S grease, this grease only, to the bearing plate eyelet. Only a thin film is required. Do not apply an excessive amount of grease in this area. Reinstall the fan assembly as described in section 1. If the problem is a clicking sound from the motor area, you may have a foreign object in the fan chamber. Uh, you want to rotate the fan to make sure it spins okay. You could also have excess sealant hanging down inside the fan case and resting on the fan blade. This will cause a ticking noise as the fan goes by the debris. Uh, to inspect the fan chamber, remove the fan case. Uh, to remove the fan case, it will require removal of these five screws. To break the seal free between the fan case and the base pan, it will be necessary to insert a flat blade screwdriver between the base pan and the fan case at this point. Pry back on the screwdriver to release the fan case from the base pan. After removing the fan case from the base assembly, it will be necessary to remove any sealant that is left on the mating surfaces on the fan case and the base assembly. Scrape off any remaining sealant with a knife or any similar tool. All the sealant must be removed in order to have a proper seal. When reinstalling the sealant to the fan case, it is very important that you do not use an excessive amount of sealant as is shown here. It eventually wears away and it will rest on the fan blade and it will cause a ticking noise as it rubs on the fan during motor operation. When reinstalling the fan case to the base assembly, Kirby Engineering recommends either the use of sealaprene sealant available in a cartridge that fits a caulking gun or Dow Corning 732 RTV available in a cartridge or a hand squeezable tube. These are the only recommended adhesives for this application. When applying the adhesive, it is very important that it is applied all the way around the outside edge of the fan case, as shown, to prevent air leaks. It is only necessary to apply a thin bead of adhesive. If too much is used, it could wear away from inside the fan chamber and hang down onto the fan blade as shown earlier and cause a ticking noise as the motor operates. After applying the approved sealant to the fan case, install the fan case to the base subassembly and install the five fan case mounting screws. Torque each of the five screws to 24 to 32 inch-pounds. 
using a rag, wipe any excess sealant that may have oozed out between the fan case and the base pan. Another cause for clicking noise from the motor area could be a damaged commutator bar on the armature. Examine and replace the armature as described in section one of the video. A defective motor bearing could also cause a clicking noise from the motor area. Examine the front and rear bearings as described in section six of the video. One other source of a problem of a clicking motor could be if the motor was wired backwards at the power switch. The left brush lead wire loops underneath the motor and should come up and plug into the top terminal of the power switch. The motor housing will be marked with a B right above the brush holder. There will be a corresponding B either at the back of the power switch or the side of the power switch. The right brush holder will have an O or an A stamped on the motor housing above the brush. The brush lead wire goes to the bottom terminal on the power switch. It will be marked with an O or an A. If this is wired backwards, the armature will be spinning in the opposite direction it normally does, and you will get the brushes making a clicking noise on the commutator bars of the armature. The B is located right here. The O is right here on the power switch. The B is stamped on the motor housing in this area. The A or the O will be stamped in this area of the motor housing. If a, upon inspecting a machine, you find that there is a lot of dirt inside your base pan area and your transmission gear and your motor sprocket gear are worn and full of dirt, uh, possible causes could be a leaking motor seal or a torn horn gasket. Inspect for the conditions as follows. To check for a pinched motor seal, remove the slide bracket casting as described in section one of the video and examine the motor seal. It's the rubber gasket located between the bearing plate and the base pan assembly of the machine. Inspect the motor seal all the way around. It should not be pinched or twisted and there should not be an air gap between the base pan and the bearing plate. Another way to examine it would be to shine a light in the front of the fan case and look for any light escaping out the back of the motor between the base pan and the bearing plate. If you suspect the motor seal is pinched, you will have to remove the motor as described in section one of the video. When replacing the new motor seal, make sure it fits in the channel all the way around the outer edge of the bearing plate. For adhesives, Kirby Engineering recommends using Permabond number 102 or Loctite Superbond number 414 as an adhesive. Apply the adhesive in the channel of the bearing plate before installing the seal. Another source of dirt leakage from the motor could be a torn horn gasket surface. If the gasket is torn, it will need to be replaced. To replace the gasket, do as follows. Install a flat blade screwdriver between the gasket and the base pan and hit the screwdriver with the palm of your hand to bend the gasket inward. Once the gasket is bent inward, you can grab a hold of it with a pair of pliers and tear it out from the rivets. Never remove the rivets, always leave the rivets in place. Once the gasket has been removed, it's necessary to clean any remaining sealant from the horn area, scrape it out with a knife, or another suitable tool. It's important that you have this area clean. Any dirt that's in the horn area should also be cleaned out. Apply a heavy uniform bead of the Dow Corning RTV sealant or the Sealoprene sealant around the outer edge of the horn gasket on the metal ring just below the gasket itself. Place the new horn gasket into place. You're gonna line up the holes with the gasket 
with the rivets that are in the horn. This should set in place right over the rivets that are already in the horn. After pressing the gasket down into place, wipe with a rag any sealant that oozes out between the gasket and the base pan. Always apply gasket lubricator prior to installing a mini emptor onto the horn gasket. To apply the gasket lubricator, simply rub it around the horn gasket to lubricate it. Then install the bag and mini emptor assembly. Once the bag and mini emptor assembly have been installed, the machine can be used immediately. The bag mini emptor assembly cannot be removed though for 96 hours or four days after the sealant has been applied to the horn gasket. It takes that amount of time for the sealant to cure. If the headlight does not work, it will be necessary to change the headlight bulb as your first step. To do so, raise the headlight cap as shown and remove these two screws. Lower the headlight cap, lift up, and pull out the headlight lens. To remove the bulb, simply pull it from the socket and install a new bulb. If the headlight still does not work after replacing a bulb, make sure that both of the contacts contained in the headlight socket are not damaged. If they are damaged, it will require replacement of the complete headlight harness assembly. Also inspect the connections to your headlight harness. There is one located underneath the clear piece of plastic tubing on top of your slide bracket casting. Slip the tubing back and check the connection to be sure it is tight. The shorter headlight lead wire plugs in the top opening located just to the right of your power switch mounting screw. Verify that that terminal is tight and plugged into the opening. Also inspect the connection of your lower headlight lead wire. This headlight lead wire plugs in through your power switch just below the right brush holder. Make sure that this connection is tight also. If the headlight still does not work after testing all of your connections, it will require replacement of the headlight harness or the jumper lead wire to repair the headlight. The last solution to a headlight not lighting could be a problem with the field coil. Replace the field coil as described in section one of the video. If the transmission has a problem of weak assist and forward and reverse, it could be due to the fact that the tread is worn from the rear wheels. If the tread looks worn or shiny, place the rear wheels. To do so, insert a flat bladed screwdriver in the opening at the back of the wheel, push down and in to release the hubcap. To remove the wheel, it will be necessary to remove the E-clip located on the axle. To do so, insert a screwdriver and pry the clip from the wheel. To remove the wheel, simply slide it off of the axle. When installing a new wheel, install with the spokes facing out, not the flat side. Line up the wheel on the axle and install the clip on the axle. When installing the hubcap, the hubcap has tabs on the back side. These tabs need to line up with the slots in the wheel. Simply push on the hubcap. Another cause for a transmission to have weak assist in forward and reverse could be due to a slide that is sticking. The slide assembly should move back and forth freely. If it does not, it will require removal of the handle pivot assembly. To remove the handle pivot assembly, remove these two screws.
Lift the handle pivot assembly from the unit. To disassemble the slide, it will require removal of the right side guide block screws, left side guide block screws, and the wedge screw. Remove the slide adjusting wedge, remove the slide, guide blocks, and roller bearings as an assembly. Examine the slide components as follows. Inspect the inner surfaces of both of the guide blocks and look for wear, rust, or pitting. If any part appears abnormally worn, rusted, or pitted, replace it. Examine the slide for wear. If there is any abnormal wear found in this area, replace the slide. Examine the roller bearing cages. Make sure that all the roller bearings are in place and that the rollers are not worn or flat spotted. Earlier model generation 3's may contain 20 rollers in each cage. It is recommended that if you have a bearing cage with 20 rollers, that you remove the very end rollers from each cage. You will have 16 rollers remaining in each cage. To remove the rollers, simply pop them out with a flat bladed screwdriver. Make sure that you have 16 rollers remaining. No less than 16 should be in each cage. To reassemble the slide components, assemble as follows. If lubrication is desired, use only WD-40. No oil or grease should be used. All G4 and Generation 3 machines produced after November of 1992 will use a slide with a centering spring. An earlier model generation 3 built before November 1992 will not. You cannot use a slide with a centering spring with any transmission that was manufactured before November of 1992. This is very important to the operation of the transmission. Install the assembled components onto the slide bracket casting. Next, install the right side guide block screws. The guide block screws should be torqued down to 25 to 30 inch pounds. As you're tightening down these two screws, apply pressure toward the headlight harness side of the machine to ensure that the guide block is even against the wall of the casting. Tighten both screws. Next, line up the slide and bearing cages by inserting the T147S shim tools. This ensures that everything is lined up properly and at the center of its travel. Next, install the wedge. The flat side of the wedge rests up against the left side guide block. Install the wedge screw. Tighten the wedge screw down to 4 inch pounds on a G4, 5 inch pounds on a Generation 3. Next, install the left side guide block screws. Torque the screws down to 25 to 30 inch pounds.
remove the shim tools and ensure that the slide moves back and forth freely. There should be some resistance to it moving forward and backward. It should not stick or hang up. Reinstall the shim tools to verify that the slide and roller bearings are aligned in the center of the travel again. Remove the shim tools. When installing the handle pivot assembly, drop it right straight down and engage the rivet on the handle pivot assembly in the yoke on the transmission linkage. Do not apply pressure on the linkage forward or backward. Also, do not move the slide back or forth. Install both shim tools to ensure that you still have the slide in the center of its travel. Install the Phillips head screws for the handle pivot assembly. Tighten the screws to 25 to 30 inch pounds. Remove the shim tools and test the operation of the slide and handle pivot assembly. The slide should travel back and forth in the slide bracket casting. The slide should not strike the front or the back of the casting with a lesser amount of pressure one way or the other. It should be centered. If it is not centered, it will be necessary to loosen the black screws again and adjust the slide forward or backward until it is centered. Also check for proper operation of your neutral drive pedal. With the pedal in the neutral position, the overload clutch gear should be separated from the drive bevel gear. The, the gear should not be touching each other with the pedal in neutral. If they are, the gears will hit each other and cause a grinding noise. Also, with the pedal in drive, the gears should lock together. This is very important to the transmission operation that they lock together. To work on the neutral drive pedal assembly, it will be necessary to remove this screw from the bottom of the transmission. Once the screw has been removed, lift up and back on the neutral drive pedal assembly and remove it. To remove the bracket lever assembly from the neutral drive pedal, lift up and out. Inspect the cam on the neutral drive pedal. The cam should not be split or cracked anywhere around the center of the shaft. If it is, the whole neutral drive pedal must be replaced. Also, inspect the bracket lever assembly. The lever should move freely, and it should slide underneath the fold on the bracket freely. Also, inspect the tip of the lever. The tip should not be worn. The tip should be rounded. If the tip is worn, replace the bracket lever assembly. Also, inspect the arm in this area. If the arm is broken or it's bent upward at an angle greater than shown here, the bracket lever assembly needs to be replaced. To remove the axle assembly from the transmission, it will be necessary to loosen the two axle clamp screws. It is not necessary to remove the screws, they just need to be loosened enough to swing the axle clamps up out of the way. Once the axle clamps are up and out of position, release the axle from the transmission by pulling outward. G4 transmissions and later model G3 transmissions contain two drive balls in the axle.
these drive balls must be in place to engage the transmission in drive. If either one of the drive balls is missing, the transmission will not operate properly. Installed drive balls if missing. And reinstall axle as described in step 18 of the video. An internal transmission defect could also cause the transmission to have weak assist in forward or reverse. If such a defect exists, it will require replacement of the complete transmission assembly. If the unit runs away in either forward or reverse, Check the operation of your slide as described in step 13 of the video. Also, make sure that the paper bag is not overfilled. If it is overfilled, the handle will not return to the upright position as it should. This will cause a machine to stay in reverse. Also, make sure your handle pivot spring assembly has the proper tension it should. When the handle is released, it should return to an upright position when tilted back. On a Generation 3, the tilt latch may be rubbing on the scuff plate. This will cause a machine to either stick in forward or reverse due to the interference. Correct the interference. Also, on a G4 or Generation 3, if the inside of the cloth bag is dirty, you should vacuum it out. The pores being trapped full of dirt in a cloth bag will affect the transmission performance. If the transmission moves in the opposite direction that the handle fork is pushed, the motor has been wired backwards at the power switch. Refer to step 10 of the video for proper brush lead routing. If the unit hops, jumps, skips, or chatters, the first item to check would be the brush roll belt. Verify that the belt is not stretched out. If it is stretched out, replace the belt. Inspect the rug plate and make sure that it is clamped on properly and not bent. It should be sealed all along the front and also it should be latched properly at the back. You can also try setting the brush roll to the green settings rather than the red. From the factory, the brush roll is set at the red settings. To change to the green, lift out the brush roll and set both end caps so the green is showing up. Reinstall the rug plate and nozzle and test the machine. If the problem still persists, adjust the slide as described in step 13 of the video. If there is still a problem after adjusting the slide, replace the transmission. Transmission removal is covered in step one of the video. Transmission installation is covered in step 30. If you are working on a generation three that did not have a slide with a centering spring installed, a slide with a centering spring can be added as long as you use any transmission manufactured since November of 1992. If the transmission primary drive belt is too tight, loosen the three transmission to base mounting screws and force the transmission to the ratchet side of the machine with a screwdriver. Loosen these three screws. It is not necessary to remove the screw. Insert the screwdriver between the base casting and the transmission, and
and pry the transmission towards the ratchet side of the machine while tightening your three transmission to base mounting screws. While still applying pressure with the screwdriver at the transmission and base, tighten the three transmission to base mounting screws. The screw should be torqued to 22 to 26 inch pounds. Tighten the front center screw first. Another cause of a rattle noise on wind down could be the primary drive gear fitting loose on the primary drive shaft. To test for this condition, put a pair of pliers on the end of the shaft and while holding the shaft stationary, try to move the gear back and forth on the shaft or wiggle it. If there is any movement to the gear, the gear needs to be replaced along with the clip. If the transmission makes a grinding noise with the pedal in the neutral position, examine the cam on the neutral drive pedal and the bracket lever assembly as described in step 13 of the video. Another possible cause for a transmission grinding when the pedal is in neutral would be that the overload clutch does not slide over the drive balls freely. The gear should slide over the drive balls freely. If it does not, either the overload clutch Drive balls and axle or all components must be re replaced to correct this condition. Early model G3 transmissions use a pin instead of drive balls in the axle. If the pin is offset, the overload clutch will not slide over the pin freely. Replace the axle with a drive ball axle and gear set, part number 102092G. This will include a new axle with drive balls, overload clutch, and drive bevel gear. It is important to replace all components as described. Another cause for a transmission grinding in neutral could be if the axle is worn where the drive bevel gear rides on the axle. To inspect for this condition, slide the drive bevel gear to the left of where it normally rides and inspect the axle at this location. Wipe off any grease to get a better idea of the condition of the axle. If the axle is still shiny, as in this case, all you would need to do is apply a thin film of T160S grease to the axle in this location. This is a heavy green grease. It's not necessary to apply a large amount of grease in this area, just enough to coat the axle. Then slide the gear back and forth a couple times to distribute the grease. If the axle had been worn in this area, if the plating was worn off or if the plating was dull, it would be necessary to replace the complete axle. When replacing the complete axle, also apply the grease in the manner shown. If a squeaking noise comes from the transmission when rolling the unit across the floor with the pedal in neutral and the motor off, it could be due to a lack of lubrication at the tip of the bracket lever assembly and the overload clutch. Remove the neutral drive pedal as described in section 13 of the video. Apply a small amount of T160S green grease to the valley of the overload clutch gear where the tip of the bracket lever assembly rides. Do not apply a large quantity of grease in this area. It is not necessary. Also apply a small dab of grease to the tip of the lever on the bracket lever assembly. If you hear a clicking noise when the unit changes direction, 
Check the slide to be sure it does not strike the slide bracket casting in either forward or reverse. If it does strike the slide casting, adjust the slide assembly as shown in step 13. A missing drive ball from the axle assembly could also cause a clicking noise when the unit changes direction. Check to be sure both drive balls are in place. If one is missing or both are missing, the unit will make a clicking noise or not operate at all when in the drive mode. Replace the drive balls as described in step 13 of the video. Also inspect the wheel hub at the center. The D-shaped opening here should not be rounded out. If it is, replace the wheel. Inspect the end of the axle where the wheel fits to the axle. If the axle is worn, it needs to be replaced. This will cause a loose fitting wheel and a clicking sound as the unit changes direction. If the unit pulls to the right or to the left, it could be due to rear wheels that are worn unevenly. Examine both wheels, replace if necessary. You could also change the wheels side to side to see if the problem is solved. Check to make sure that the rug plate is properly installed and is not bent. Replace the rug plate if bent. Make sure that the brush roll is installed properly. Both end caps should be set to the same color setting. Inspect the front wheel shaft to be sure it is not bent. If it is bent, it will cause the nozzle to dig into the carpet on one side. The base pan could be bent if the machine was dropped. There could also be a problem with the machining of the fan case or nozzle. To test for this condition, set the unit on a level surface and make sure the nozzle contacts the surface evenly. Lower the nozzle and be sure it touches down on both sides at the same time. Pulling to the right or left could also be caused by a defect in the carpet itself. Test the unit on a different carpet. The BPI light should be a steady green color as the brush roll is spinning. If it is not, repair as follows. Make sure that the brush roll belt is not stretched or broken. If the brush roll does not spin freely, it could be due to a frozen bearing or just dirt in the bearing. Remove the end caps and examine the bearing. Dirt or hair could be caught between the bearing and the end of the brush roll. Clean out the debris with a knife, screwdriver, or other suitable tool. On a Generation 3 brush roll, make sure that the magnet is in the magnet ring assembly. If the magnet ring is damaged or the magnet is missing, it will be necessary to replace the complete brush roll. It is not possible to replace just the magnet ring. The magnets on a G4 production brush roll are contained under this gray cap. The service brush roll for a Generation 3 or G4 also has magnets contained under the cap. The cap is black in color for the service brush roll. Also make sure the end caps are on the correct end of the brush roll. The small end cap goes on the magnet ring end of the brush roll. If the caps are on the wrong end, the magnet will be at the wrong side of the nozzle and will not light the BPI light. If the BPI light is defective and requires replacement, remove the nozzle bumper. Then remove this screw. Remove the BPI light from the nozzle casting. When replacing a BPI light, use the correct light for the correct model. Generation 3 and G4 BPI lights are different in their construction.
If you are having a problem with the brush roll belts breaking easily, examine the brush roll. Be sure it does not bind. It should spin freely. If it does bind, try to free up the bearings or replace the brush roll as described in step 22. If the motor is wired backwards, it will cause the brush roll belt to slip off of the end of the fan pulley and get caught on the belt lifter hook. Refer to step 10 for proper brush lead wire routing. If the unit does not pick up dirt properly or has little or no suction, check the brush roll belt. Be sure it is not stretched or broken. Replace if either condition exists. Also make sure the brush roll is properly adjusted. If the brush roll binds, free up the bearings or replace the brush roll. If the fan blade is broken or has worn blades, replace the complete fan assembly as described in section 1 and section 30 of the video. Also examine the paper bag. If there is dirt above the full line on the bag, it will decrease the airflow through the unit. Examine the top adapter and fill tube. If they are clogged, they will need to be cleaned. Remove any debris from inside the mini emptor. Also remove any debris found inside the horn area or inside the fan chamber itself. Remove any debris that is found inside the nozzle casting. If the motor has been wired backwards, the unit will have no suction. Check the brush lead wire routing as described in step 10 of the video. When the handle fork is released, it should return to a vertical position. If it does not, it could be due to a bent latch plate or a bent handle pivot assembly. If the latch plate is bent, it will be necessary to remove these two screws from the bottom of the handle fork. Replace the latch plate. Do not attempt to straighten it out. If the handle pivot spring assembly is bent, replace as described in step 13 of the video. If the handle fork falls down, make sure the paper bag is not full of dirt and test with the cord off of the cord hooks on the handle fork. If the spring is weak on the handle pivot assembly, replace the handle pivot assembly as described in step 13 of the video. If the tilt latch lever is broken, replace as follows. Unscrew the tilt latch shaft from both ends and slide the shaft apart. Pick out the broken part, install a new lever, and screw the shaft back together. It will be necessary to hold the handle fork all the way down when repairing the lever. If the bag top latch is broken, replace as follows. Cut off the old bag top latch with a pair of side cutting pliers. Do not cut the strap on the bag, only cut the latch itself. Remove the broken latch and install a service latch. The service latch will have a notch cut out at the bottom to allow you to install the latch onto the strap. Install the latch with the Kirby name facing the rear of the bag.
if the suction blower end of the hose requires replacement, you can apply heat to the inner cuff of the hose in this area shown with a heat gun to soften the cuff, twist and pull to remove. You can also immerse either end of the hose in hot water until the cuff becomes soft enough to twist and remove. If water or heat is not available, you can place a screwdriver inside and pry away the cuff. Be careful not to damage the hose or the cuff when using the screwdriver method. To assemble the motor, insert the field coil into the motor housing. The terminals of the field coil should point toward the rear of the motor housing. Insert the screws and nuts. The nuts used in this assembly are locking nuts. If a nut is lost, reassemble using a locking nut. Torque the screws to 16 to 20 inch pounds. Install the static washer into the motor housing. This terminal should come through this hole on the motor housing. Install the finger spring into the motor housing. The fingers should point to the front of the motor housing. Slide the armature into the motor housing. Install the bearing plate over the armature shaft. The bearing plate has a right angle corner. This should be at the lower right corner of the motor as viewed from the front. And there are also two tabs that stick out from the back of the bearing plate. These tabs should be lined up with the opening on the side of the motor housing. The bearing plate uses four small diameter head screws to mount to the motor housing. Do not use the larger diameter head screws in this location. Place the locking nut in the motor housing. Insert the bearing plate screw. Torque the screws down to 16 to 20 inch pounds. Install the motor sprocket gear onto the armature shaft with the shoulder facing the outside of the motor and the gear teeth facing the motor housing. Install the snap ring onto the armature. Being careful not to stretch the snap ring any farther than is necessary to install the clip. Install the power switch to the motor assembly, making sure that there are eight terminals in place on the field coil and all of the terminals are straight. Rest the power switch up against the motor housing in this area to use it as a guide to avoid bending the terminals on the field. When sliding the power switch on, make sure that the power switch slides behind the tabs located on the bearing plate. Install the power switch mounting screw and torque the screw to 4 to 6 inch pounds. To install the left brush holder assembly, align this tab with the slot in the motor housing located just above the field nut. Push the brush in against the armature, insert the tab into the slot, and rotate the brush down. 
install the screw, torque the screw to four to six inch pounds. Route the brush lead wire through these slots located in the motor housing and bring the brush lead wire up and plug it into the B terminal on the power switch. When installing the fan assembly, install a thin visible layer of Kirby Engineering approved T159S grease to the bearing plate eyelet. It is only necessary to apply a thin film of grease in this area. Install the spacer seal assembly. Install the Mylar washer. Install the fan blade. Install the metal washer. And install the pulley. Snug down the fan pulley. Do not over tighten it by inserting an 11 30 seconds wrench on the rear of the armature just ahead of the rear bearing and inserting a fan locking tool to tighten the pulley. Prior to installing the motor assembly into the base sub-assembly, check the motor seal for damage. If damaged, install a new motor seal. To reduce the risk of improper installation, apply an engineering approved sealant to the motor seal channel of the bearing plate prior to placing the motor seal in the channel. Approved sealants are Permabond number 102 and Loctite Superbond number 414. Install a motor assembly into the base pan. Press down on the back of the motor to be sure it is locked into position. Install the static wire onto the terminal of the static washer. Secure the wire to the brush holder assembly using a tie wrap. And cut off the end of the tie wrap. Install the left motor mount screw. The screw must pass through the eyelet of the static wire when installing the screw. Torque the screw to 22 to 26 inch pounds. As you tighten the screw, ensure that the static wire is ahead of the wheel well on the base casting. Do not allow the static wire to face the back of the machine as it will interfere with the transmission linkage. Turn the base pan over and install the front motor mount screws in the wells located behind the fan case. Torque the screws to 22 to 26 inch pounds. A loose screw could cause a motor vibration problem. If the screw will not tighten, replace the clip on the motor housing. Place the exhaust grill into position in the base pan casting and hold it steady with either a flat bladed screwdriver or a pair of needle nose pliers. Slide the exhaust duct down until it snaps into position. Install the exhaust duct screw and torque this screw to four to six inch pounds. Install the actuator rod to the power switch. Insert it in the bottom of the opening at the power switch. Hold the actuator rod at a 90 degree angle and pull up. Install the headlight jumper lead wire into the opening at the power switch indicated here. Make sure that the jumper wire plugs securely into the field terminal and is not loose. Install the shorter headlight lead wire into the opening at the power switch near the power switch mounting screw.
make sure that the wire plugs securely into the field terminal. Install the right brush lead wire onto the lower terminal of the power switch. The tab on the bottom of the brush holder fits into a slot located in the motor housing. Insert the tab at the bottom of the brush holder into the slot on the motor housing and rotate the brush upward to engage the brush in the motor housing. Install the brush holder mounting screw. Torque this screw to 4 to 6 inch pounds. Rotate the slide bracket casting into position and connect the headlight jumper lead wire to the headlight harness. Make sure the connection is tight. Slide the clear plastic tubing over the connection and secure the tubing with a wire tie to the leg of the slide bracket casting. Snip off the excess. It is very important that both headlight lead wires are routed around the outside of the leg of the slide bracket casting. They should not be to the inside of the leg. Install the mounting screws to the rear of the slide bracket casting legs. Torque these screws to 16 to 20 inch pounds. Install the front slide bracket casting mounting screws. These screws pass through the fan case at the front of the unit. Torque these screws to 24 to 32 inch pounds. When replacing an axle assembly, it is important to note that the drive ball recesses are a greater distance on the left side of the axle than they are on the right. When installing the drive balls, it will be helpful to apply a small dab of grease in the drive ball recesses to help hold the balls in position during assembly. From the left side of the axle, install the overload clutch gear onto the axle. Be sure that it slides over the drive balls freely. Next, install the drive bevel gear. The teeth on the drive bevel gear must face the overload clutch gear. Install the washer. Install the bearing. The bearing has a washer on the inner section. The washer should face the center of the axle assembly. Install the bushing. The large shoulder of the bushing faces the outer end of the axle assembly. Install the wheel. And install the wheel retainer clip. On the right side of the axle, install the drive ball retainer. The cup portion of the retainer should slide over and mate with the overload clutch gear. Install the spring. Install the bearing with the washer section toward the center of the axle assembly. Install the bushing with the large shoulder toward the outside edge of the axle. Install the wheel and install the wheel retainer clip. It is important that when you install the wheels, you have the wheels with the spokes facing the outside of the axle assembly. The assembled components should be arranged as shown. If you are working on an axle assembly that has a black axle and a drive bevel gear with a bushing in it, do not interchange the axle or the drive bevel gear with components as are shown on this axle assembly. When in installing the axle assembly into the transmission, it is important that the bushings on either end of the axle 
made up with the bosses at the outside edges of the transmission. The bearings on the axle assembly must fit inside the bosses located on the transmission case in this area. Also, the bushings are tapered. The narrow portion should face the top of the transmission on both sides. To install, insert the left side bushing partially into the well. Compress the bearing against the spring to allow it to clear the buses on the transmission case. And snap into position. Rotate both axle clamps down. The axle clamp should rest over the bushings. The part should be positioned as shown. Torque the axle clamp screws to 18 to 24 inch pounds. To install the neutral drive pedal assembly, depress the pedal on the drive side. Install the bracket lever assembly onto the neutral drive pedal and insert the pedal assembly into the back of the transmission. Install the neutral drive pedal assembly mounting screw. Torque this screw to 12 to 16 inch pounds. To install the transmission into the base subassembly, it will be necessary to raise the actuator rod. Insert the transmission from the bottom of the base subassembly. As you insert the transmission into the base casting, it is necessary to install the primary drive belt onto the transmission gear and on the motor sprocket gear. Also, line up the linkage on the transmission with the rivet on the handle pivot assembly. They must lock together. The transmission linkage and rivet of the handle pivot assembly should line up as shown. Install the three transmission to base mounting screws and torque the screws to 22 to 26 inch pounds. Install the front center screw first. If the primary drive belt is tight, loosen the transmission mounting screws and pry the transmission toward the ratchet side of the machine with a screwdriver. The belt should deflect from 3 8 to 1 half inch between the gears. To install the foot pedal, raise the actuator rod up, slide the foot pedal on, and carefully depress the foot pedal on the clamps at the top of the transmission. Install the cover shell to the base subassembly. Slide it on as shown. Install the rear cover shell screws at either side of the foot pedal. Torque the screws to 12 to 16 inch pounds. Install the front cover shell screws. Torque these screws to 26 to 30 inch pounds. Install the scuff plate. Gently push forward and down to engage the front tabs of the scuff plate. To lock the rear of the scuff plate on, press down right at the slot. Install the scuff plate screw just above the neutral drive pedal assembly. Torque this screw to 5 to 7 inch pounds. Install the power cord into the power switch. 
install the cord cover. Engage the tab at the bottom of the cord cover in the opening of the base assembly. Rotate the cover upward and engage the grommet of cord in the opening of the cord cover. Push the cord cover towards the front of the unit to engage this tab into the base opening. Install the cord cover mounting screw and torque this screw to 5 to 8 inch pounds. Install the cord clip to the scuff plate. Replace the tie wrap if broken or missing. Torque the screw to 7 to 11 inch pounds. When assembled, the cord should be routed as shown and away from the rear wheels. You may now install the nozzle, handle fork, and bag mini emptor assembly. Before installing the mini emptor, always apply gasket lubricant to the surface of the horn gasket. The Micron Magic filtration system uses shrink wrap to connect the bag top adapter, fill tube, and mini emptor assembly. There is a layer of shrink wrap covering the fill tube ties where the fill tube attaches to the mini emptor. The bag top adapter is attached to the fill tube using shrink wrap only. There are no fill tube ties. If any part of this system has failed, whether it be the top adapter, the fill tube, or the mini emptor, it will require replacement of the complete assembly. Shrink wrap is not available. If a Generation 3 bag top assembly requires service, repair as follows. Slide the screwdriver between the bar and the bag top and pry up at either end to release the bar. Slide off the bag top cover. To remove the bag top latch, twist the spring around the drawbar hook until the hook is disconnected from the spring. Remove the bottom drawbar hook in the same manner. And remove the hook from the bag hanger bar. And slide the bag hanger bar out of the bag assembly. When inserting a new bar, it is important to note that there is a different gap between the ends of the bar and the bag itself. The bar should only be installed in this direction. Insert the hook into the new draw bar and insert the spring. Wind the spring around until both feet of the hook come out the top coil of the spring. Insert the hook through the bag top latch. Squeeze the feet together on the hook and insert it a couple coils into the spring. And wind the spring around until both feet come out the bottom of the spring. It is very important that when you are done, the both feet are hanging out the bottom and both feet are hanging out the top on the hooks. With the feet hanging out the top and the bottom of the spring properly, you should be able to pull on the spring and not have the spring or the hooks pull apart. To assemble the bag top, 
it will be necessary to have the Kirby logo on the latch locating to the back side of the bag in order to have the bag latched to the handle grip properly. If it's not in the right position, simply rotate it around 180 degrees to get it in the correct position. It should be positioned as shown. Slide the bag top cover on the bag with the higher portion facing the rear of the bag. Install the hanger bar onto the tabs of the bag top by placing one end of a handle fork spring shaft, part number 137173, over the washer and tapping down until the washer is secure to the tab on the bag top cover. The bag top cover then should be securely attached to the bag assembly. Kirby Engineering recommends that you install the correct part for each specific model. Installing the wrong part will affect the performance of the unit. Transmissions used on the Generation 3 and G4 are not interchangeable. Paper disposable and outer cloth bags are not interchangeable. BPI light assemblies used in the nozzle castings are not interchangeable. Also, slides with the centering spring require the use of a transmission manufactured since November of 1992 or later. The first five digits of the serial number located on the barcode label at the base of the transmission should read 19211 or after. <laughs>